All right, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome all of you back to the man cave. All right, a little upgrade here. If you're joining us for the first time today, I want to say welcome to you. Maybe you're here to honor your dad. I want to welcome all of you to Northway, where last weekend we started this brand new series, Stories from the Man Cave. And, and maybe, guys, you're, you're here with your dad, and I just want to welcome you here. Maybe, I don't know, your girlfriend, maybe she bribed you to get you here uh, today. You know, maybe your mom threatened you. You will come with me today. <laughs> Maybe your buddy told you that we were getting away uh, Pirates and Penguins tickets, but uh, obviously, man, it was a tough crowd, man. Trying to give stuff away, being all nice, and people are like, I don't, I don't trust them. <laughs> you know? <laughs> What's going to happen to me? Tickets. That's all, you know? Anyway, so we're in this, this series, Stories from the Man Cave, where guys, we're learning that what makes a man is the story that his life tells. See, every guy can probably have good stories that he can share around the man cave, but not every man's life tells a good story. So we're studying Samson, right? He's one of the judges of Israel, and this is a part of a larger series that we're doing on the book of Judges, and actually we're going to come back to finish our study in Judges in August, so make sure you're here for that. If you missed last week, you can go online and hear the message at northway.org. The pastor that taught that message is really good looking. He uh, is a really funny guy. From what I hear, he, has, he does a really good Russell Crowe impersonation. Everybody, so before we get started today, I want to remind you that uh, on your Northway notes, we have recommended a book for the guys in this series called Fight from Pastor Craig Groeschel, uh, senior pastor at LifeChurch.tv uh, down in Oklahoma, over in Oklahoma. And guys, I would highly recommend this book to you. Short read, short chapters in it, hilarious stories. This is a really good challenge for men from Samson's life. So in this series, we've been borrowing some points uh, from this book, uh, Fight, uh, that Pastor Craig Groeschel about Samson. So if you weren't here last week, let me catch you up to speed of where we've been, and then uh, we'll get started today. Guys, we learned last week that Samson was a guy just like you and me, regular dude, with such God-given potential but then we saw him continue to squander that God-given potential, turning aside time and time again. He would continue to isolate himself inside the man cave, and he just seemed to squander this potential time again. And he, he ended up breaking his vows to God in the man cave, getting in a lot of trouble because of these mistakes. We saw that his, his pride, his, his lust, his entitlement led him to places that he never should have been that places he never dreamed that he would be in, his anger, his emotions completely out of control, and a lot of people got hurt. And in a moment of desperation, he finally cries out to God, and he says, I can't take it anymore. And God heard his cry for help, and he comes to rescue Samson, and he made him strong again. And last week we saw chapter 15 of Judges end with this, after all this squandering, that 20 years of apparent faithfulness that Samson judged Israel. So now as we look at chapter 16 today, I want to remind us all of the question that we asked last week, how could a man with such God-given potential mess up his life so badly? Because now after 20 years of apparent faithfulness, we're going to see that Samson, he lets his guard down and he tiptoes back towards the traps that Satan has set for him. He goes back into a place where his old habits got him into trouble, right? Samson's lust, his entitlement, his pride creep back in, this time to take him out completely. Samson, this really strong guy, killer hair, bulging biceps, taken out by his weaknesses. So as we dig in here today, let me ask us all a question. If you were Satan, where would you take yourself out? Right? If, do you know the areas of weakness in your life that the enemy will leverage to destroy you? Because the enemy knows them. And he knew them for Samson. He knew Samson's weakness. And he lured him back into these subtle traps. So I want to go to the end of Samson's story here and then see where it ended up with him and then we'll get to the beginning of Judges 16, okay? 
Here we find enemy, or excuse me, Samson now, where he is captured by the enemy Philistines. Both of his eyes are gouged out. Shackled and imprisoned literally becomes the entertainment for 3,000 plus Philistines and 20 years of faithfulness. How in the world did Samson end up there? How do men that are destined for greatness end up on a path to destruction? And the answer is one step at a time. One little step at a time. Samson took one little step in the wrong direction and then another and then another and it would eventually cost him his life. And for many of us who are here today, we can relate with Samson, can't we? While our one step obviously didn't cost us our life, maybe it cost somebody, somebody else's theirs. Maybe it cost you your marriage. Maybe it cost you the custody of your kids, your job, your reputation, your life savings, whatever it might be for you. Think about it, guys. You know, very few men, they, they screw up all at once, right? Most men don't plan to mess up their life all at once. No, they make one bad decision followed by one that, to try to cover it up, followed by another lie to try to, you know, maybe get out of that one. And Samson didn't ruin his life all at once. He ruined it one step at a time. So now let's, that we've been to the end of his life, let's take a look at Judges 16, 1 together if you have your Bibles. One day, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. And he went in to spend the night with her and the people of Gaza were told, Samson's here. And so they surrounded the place and lay in wait with him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night saying, at dawn, we'll kill him. Now listen, Samson is very deep into enemy territory, the Philistines' territory. Gaza is 25 miles away from home, and it's the Philistine headquarters. And one day, he decides to just go to a place again where he has no business going straight now into the heart of the enemy territory. It's like he's looking for action, like he had back in the day. And the first thing that we see from Samson, like many of us do, if you're taking notes with me, is that Samson rationalized the same old sin. He rationalized it. And men are the masters at rationalizing the same old sins, aren't we guys? Samson, he, he falls back into these traps of lust and entitlement in his life. Remember, I want it, I have to have it. In fact, I deserve it, right? That, that's what happens to him. And he goes back to the forbidden woman again. Like he didn't learn his lesson the first time. And he returns to the enemy's woman. There's a lot of wisdom in the Bible about a situation like this. Proverbs 26, 11 says, like dogs return to their vomit, so fools repeat their folly. And Samson repeats his folly. Samson's career, if we want to call it that, is on the line. See, his, his family, his, his reputation as a judge is on the line. His people, the Israelites, their safety is on the line. He himself is in so much danger. See, how could somebody be so stupid, right? Think about it. To risk so much for such little pleasure. And the answer is... Men, do it every single day. So now watch, one step's gonna lead him into another trap, gonna lead him into another, look at this. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and he took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. And he lifted them onto his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now, everybody, th this is ridiculously impressive. The Hulk has nothing on Samson here. This is crazy how strong he is that he's able to rip these two doors right off of their hinges. But they're not just any ordinary doors like you and I have in, in our homes. No, these were giant doors of a fortified city, kind of try to picture this in your mind, right? The, the, these doors would lock out the bad people, right? And, and they would keep the people safe in Gaza for their protection. Commentaries on this passage say that these doors 
would have weighed in the neighborhood of like 600 to 700 pounds each. And Samson's so stinking strong, he just lifts them up onto his shoulders and he carries them up the hill. This guy is strong. And it's like we're seeing the old Samson here, right? In his pride. And he's like, what's he doing? He's going, you think you can handle this? You think that you're safe from what I can do to you, Philistines? You haven't seen anything yet of what I can do to you. And what's he doing here? If you're taking notes, he's taunting the enemy. He's taunting the enemy, and this is really stupid, right? I mean, think about it. He taunts the enemy Philistines, and guys, before you think this is stupid, we, we do this every day. We taunt our enemy, Satan, by thinking that we can be in a place where, oh, we won't fall into temptation. We taunt the enemy by thinking, oh, nobody's going to get hurt. Nobody will find out. We think that we can handle just one more drink, right? We think that we can handle just one little peek at pornography, right? We think that we can handle going up to her bedroom and sitting on the bed like nothing's going to happen. We think that we can handle just one more lie so that we can get ahead and climb that ladder, right? We think that we can handle that just one cheating, one, one time. Nobody's going to get hurt. Nobody will know. And guys, we tiptoe up to that line. Believing that we can handle this temptation in our own strength. But we're going to see in Samson's life and eventually in ours that when you mess with the lion, somebody's bound to get hurt. And it's usually not the lion. See, what, what you thought that you could handle leads to another nasty trap, leads to more rationalization of that sin and you thinking you can handle it. So you taunt the enemy to the point, listen everybody, to the point where God's gonna say to us, okay, have it your way. I'm going to lift my hand of protection from you and I'm gonna hand you over to your sin. Have it your way. And guys, this is how one little step leads to our eyes being gouged out. And you say to me, Pastor Ken, hold it, time out. That's a little extreme, man. You're being extreme here. Well, you're right, your, your eyes might not be gouged out, but I'm here to tell you, it's gonna be worse. All right, guys, see, I have a friend whose marriage is over, it's done, ruined, because he rationalized pornography. I have a friend who is serving time in federal prison right now because he cooked the books and he thought he would never get caught. Guys, I'm here to tell you, it could be so much worse. See, your wife says to you, there's not going to be another time. I'm done. We're getting divorced. See, your kids could say, Dad, we don't even care anymore because you never keep your promises. And 20 years from now, guys, your kids want nothing to do with you because you were at work so much. Your boss says to you, no, no more. You've been cutting corners around here long enough. You're fired. See, guys, this is the stuff that when, happens when we rationalize our sin and we taunt the enemy. So let's see how it plays out in Samson's life. Judges 16, 4. Sometime later, hey there, Delilah, right? Okay, that's my version. He fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. He is blinded by his lust one more time. Samson falls for the enemy's woman, and this time the hooks are in deep. Now, let me give you the Kent Chevalier version of what's going to happen next, okay? The Philistines, they come to Delilah, who is one of them, and they offer her a large sum of money so that she could figure out how Samson could be so strong and how they could eventually capture him and kill Samson. Remember, it's payback time for the thousand men of chapter 15, right? Samson killed a thousand of their men, and it's payback time. So Samson, blinded by his lust, he gets into bed with Delilah and a little pillow talk ensues. Here's my version. Delilah says, oh, Samson, <laughs> my love. Y you like that voice a little bit better than my Russell Crowe? All right. Oh, Samson, my love, can you tell me the secret of your strength so that you could be tied up and subdued? Now, if you're Samson, think about this for one second, okay? 
I'm not sure if he thinks that the Marvin Gaye album just got kicked on, right? Or if he's just this stupid to really not think that something sneaky's going on, like handing him over to the Philistine enemy, right? Think about it for a second. So here's my version. Three times she asks him this question. Three times he lies to her, and each time getting a little more close, right? Three times Samson falls asleep in her bed. Three times he wakes up exactly tied up in the way that she told him to uh, tie him up and that she invites the Philistines into her bedroom to hide out to see if once he breaks free, they could, they could subdue him in the way that, you know, she tied him up. But three different times he wakes up tied up and he breaks free when she says, the Philistines are upon you. And he breaks free. Three different failed attempts of the Philistines to capture Samson. And now, you, you'd think, right? You'd think that Samson would wise up. But no. His lust, it's in deep. The pleasure feels so good. And Delilah must look real good. He's blinded by what the enemy has for him. He's got a trap in front of him. He can't see. He can't think right of what's really going on here. But here it comes. Okay, here's what happens. Here it comes. Look at verse 16. With such nagging, Delilah prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. Now, ladies, let me talk with you for just one second. I want you to see a deep spiritual truth here in this verse. Not everything in the scripture, ladies, is an example for us to follow. I, I would highly recommend that you not follow Delilah's example here. Because as you can see, nagging your man is what the enemy does. That's my interpretation of this <laughs> verse, right? So don't nag your man. It never ends well. And guys, you're welcome, right there. <laughs> Ladies, okay, I'm joking. No communicator cards, please. It's just a joke, all right? So Samson, he can't take it anymore. This woman nagging me, and he finally caves in. And he told her everything in verse 17, it says. He told her everything. Now remember, last week, this is really important, the Nazarite vow, right? This is where Samson, he made a vow to God and he said, this is how I'm going to commit my life to you. Three different promises, right? And the first one was this, I'm not going to touch dead stuff, right? Failed, right? Then I'm not going to get drunk. Failed, right? And then I'm not going to cut my hair. You can see where this is going, right? All right, so he tells her everything. I, okay, 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 I've never cut my hair before because th that's my vow to God. That's what gives me strength. If, if you were to shave my head, I'd be as weak as any other man. There, please stop nagging me, okay? And he tells her everything. And number three, you see that Samson, at this point, assumed his disobedience would never cost him. That's what he assumed. And a lot of guys, we, we do the same thing, don't we, right? Not just guys, all of us, right? Ladies included. We don't think we'll get caught. We think that somehow that we, we, we think that it's never going to catch up to us, but mark my words today that what's done in the depths will always find its way to the surface. What's done in the dark will always find its way into the light. It sure did for Samson. So let's take a look at what happens. Judges 16, verse 18. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands to pay her off, right? And after putting Samson to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. And then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep and thought, 
well, I'll just go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And then the Philistines, they seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding grain in the prison. See, with each day's rationalizations and taunting the enemy, Samson never dreamed that his actions would cost him everything. Samson's a guy just like us, a man with such God-given potential. He got himself into this mess one little step at a time away from God. He failed epically here. He failed his family. He failed his people, the Israelites. But most importantly, he failed his God by breaking his vows one little step at a time. He stepped away from God. And so let me ask you today, where are you stepping away from God? Is it your lust? Is it your entitlement you think you deserve it? Is it your pride? Is it your greed? Is it your apathy? Where are you stepping away from God? Where have you failed your family? Where are you failing God? Because I know I have. It wasn't pretty. And I'm not proud of the things that I did when I was stepping away from God. So what now? What do you do when you realize that you're stepped away from God? What do you do when you realize that you failed, that you've blown it? What do you do when you realize that you can't undo the failure and its impact in your life? Well, I think that there's two different responses to failure. The first and the natural one is remorse. Remorse. See, this is being sorry because you got caught, right? And it might even be genuine. It might even be, you know, sincere shame that you feel, but it's primarily because you got caught. See, if you probably wouldn't have got caught, you'd probably still be doing what it is that you're doing, right? It's feeling guilty because you were found out. This is my buddy whose marriage is over. This is my friend who is serving time. The natural response is remorse once you've been captured. This is Samson. Samson has failed so bad, and he's sorry now that he's got caught. And guys, if this is you today, really anybody in the room, I want you to know some truth today. I'm about to speak some truth right into your heart. That your failure does not define you. Hear the truth today. That failure is an event. It's not a person. It's never a person. You are not a failure. And just because you may have made a bad decision or a thousand of them, you might be down, but just like Samson, you are not out. Because the God of the Bible that I know and serve specializes in taking our mistakes and wiping our slate clean. So maybe you've been caught, or maybe you're here today and you haven't been caught yet. The second and the better response to failure is repentance. See, it's, it's, guys, if you're here today and you're stepping away from God in any area of your life, here's what you need to do. Turn around. Turn back to God. That's what repentance is. Own up to it. Realize that it's nobody else's mistake except yours and be man enough to admit it. Repentance is turning around and saying, I blew it. I messed it up and I own up to it. Samson was 25 miles away from home and nobody made him go there. That is 56,250 steps away from his home. He didn't choose to ruin his life all at once. One step at a time as he went to Gaza, he had an opportunity with each step to turn back to God, to go back home where he belonged. 
He had every opportunity to turn around. And when we do turn around, I promise you that God will be right there with you with arms open wide, ready to receive you when you turn around. Yes, there are some things that you can't unsin, but you can repent of and turn around from and receive that forgiveness for. See, don't let what you did stop you from what God wants to do in you. Don't let what you did in your past stop you from what God wants to do through you in your future. Turn around today. Ask for God's forgiveness. Turn back to him. Ask for your family's forgiveness. Be a man today and say, I'm turning away from my way of doing life because I know that it's getting me nowhere and into a lot of trouble and a lot of emptiness and I'm gonna turn around today and go God's way because it leads to life. This road leads to destruction and I know it and I'm turning around today and I wanna be given life by God. See, there are some of us that you still have to suffer the consequences of the actions that you have chosen to do, but you can do so knowing that you are forgiven and set free by God. See, Samson, he was suffering the consequences of his actions. This is where we find him, but God was still with him. His eyes are gouged out and he's the laughing stock of the Philistine enemy, but God was still with him. Even in Samson's failure, God was going to accomplish his purposes for his life. Remember that the Philistines are the enemy of God's people, the Israelites, right? And even in the shackles of his consequences, Samson finally realized that he's still God's man. He still is set apart from birth with such God-given potential to save Israel from the Philistine enemy. This once pride-filled man was now broken on his knees before God because now it's all about God in his life. It's no longer about him. And he's brought, this is the scene, try to imagine this. He's brought before the Philistines in their temple to their false god, Dagon. 3,000 plus Philistines. Just imagine layers to this building that people are standing and looking down upon Samson. As he is brought in, just try to imagine this, shackled, bound up, they bring him out and the drunken crowd goes wild. Entertain us, Samson, they cry. And he does. And they place him in between two very central support beams to the temple. And Samson realizes something. That if God could just strengthen him just once more. That if he could just give him one more shot. That if one more opportunity where God could empower him. That with one massive push of these central pillars. That he could take out all of those Philistines that are there. The enemy. Right? And all of the rulers that are there, he could take them out with one massive push. And look at his prayer in verse 28. Samson prayed, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. And indeed, God did remember Samson. And God leveraged Samson's mistakes and he turned them into an opportunity where he could defeat the enemy. And Samson died that day, along with 3,000 plus Philistines in that temple. And you want to know what his life is now remembered for? That he was a guy who laid down his life for his people so that the enemy could not come and destroy them. See, he gave up his life to save his people from the enemy. And guys, there are some of you here today, women, there are some of you here today that you need to pray that exact same prayer that Samson prayed. Lord, remember me just once more. Please, God, give me one more chance, God, because I realize today I want to die to myself today And I want to have a story that says I'm living for you. That's what I want my life story to be all about. Not my accomplishments, not what I can conquer, not my hobbies, not my bank account, and certainly not my failures. But God, I want my life story to be about you saving me 
and me now living for you. And all of us here today, we need to turn around. All of us, because you know that your way of doing things is leading towards a life of destruction. And we need to turn around into the way that leads to life. And we, God made that way. His name is Jesus Christ. He made a way where there seemed to be no way. And you might be here right now saying, there's no possible way that anybody could ever find out about this. I just can't do it, right? I'm in so deep, there's no way that this God could free me. And I'm here to tell you the truth today that God made a way through his son, Jesus Christ, dying on a cross for anything that you've ever done or will do. He has set you free from your sin. All of us here today, we need God's forgiveness because none of us are perfect. All of us that are here today, we need God's grace because we all miss the mark. We need God to save us and strengthen us. And all we have to do is to admit it. That like Samson, we have squandered our God-given potential. That we've broken our vows that we've made to God. And to believe that God made a way through his son Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins as our deliverer and put our faith and our trust in him today and what he accomplished on the cross and turn around and follow him. And so I want to give you that opportunity today. So I'm going to ask that you stand with me and I'm going to ask that everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. We're going to come before God. So there are some of you that are here today that you know that God is speaking to you right now. There's something going on on the inside and you know it. You feel something. You're not sure what it is, but I can tell you that's the Holy Spirit drawing you to God. There are some of you here today that have never made a decision to give your life to Jesus. And that's what you need to do today, to turn around and follow God's way. And so if that's you, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to simply just raise your hand, look at me, so that I can agree with you that today is the day on this Father's Day that I'm gonna make a decision to turn around and follow Jesus, give him my life, because I realize, man, I'm not really doing a good job at leading myself anywhere but to destruction. And so God, today I'm gonna to place my trust in you by following your son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for me, who set me free. And you might not understand what all that means, but you wanna make that decision today. And so if that's you right now, I just simply want you to raise your hand and be able to look at me so that I can agree with you. And so I can mark today that this is the day that you've made that decision. Go ahead and raise your hand and so I can see it. Keep it up and I agree with you right here, sir. And that's all I'm gonna do. I just simply wanna agree in that back row back there. I just wanna agree with you and mark today right here, sir. I see you right here. Ma'am, I see you right here. I agree with you today. I'm just making my way, my left to, to my right, I'm making my way around. Sir, I see you right in that back row, I see you, okay? I agree with you today, all right? Anybody else, I mean, just it, believe me, if I miss it, believe me, God sees it. I see your hand right there, sir. I see you, yes, okay? Believe me, if I missed it, God sees your hand today and mark this moment that you have made a decision to follow Jesus and we're gonna help you to know what that means now to follow him with your life, okay? So let me just pray for us and seal this moment. God, thank you for these folks that have made the decision to turn around and follow Jesus your way. And God, I just praise you for you changing lives continually in this church, through this church, that you continue to make yourself known to people throughout the world. And we thank you for that intimate relationship that we can have with you. And God, we just praise you for this moment. And everybody said, amen.